we get a lot of questions from, from various uh, community organizations that are asking how we're doing some of the work we're doing, whether that's been with our day sheltering program, our meal program, the coordinated entry, the, the overnight white flag shelters. Uh, we get a lot of folks that ask how are we doing this, and especially when they find out that we're such a small church. Um, and so part of this is to be able to help others to, to see what we've done, to, to see that it's possible no matter what size you are, um, finding out how you can plug in into your community wherever you're at, uh, how to take those first steps, and even learn from our mistakes. We didn't have a lot of folks we could reach out to as we started some of this work um, to, to learn what we should be doing. Uh, so we've learned a lot by ourselves. Uh, we've made some mistakes, learned from those, and continue to, to grow and make mistakes and learn. Um, so part of it is to be able to, to help uh, inspire that change, to give folks answers that are looking for those answers, um, and to be able to connect community because a lot of what we do in, in this work is ultimately building relationships and able to uh, help people grow uh, in their own selves, whether it's spiritually or, or just uh, in, in being able to serve the, the uh, people of their communities and fulfill their passions and purposes. Yeah. Additionally, um, depending on the content we generate here, it can be used in fundraising activities and grant activities. It becomes a historical document because it, it, hopefully there will be stories shared here about how we've gotten to where we are that would get lost as I and Vance and Willie move on in one way or another. So it, it's important to capture that history because I can tell you, working with Jay Kelterman, our founding member, there are more stories he's forgotten than he can remember to tell us now, and they aren't captured anywhere. We were about, I would say about 3.30, November 18, 2020. Remember the exact date, uh, has personal reasons why. Yeah, there's a significant piece of that date. Yeah. For you. <laughs> But uh, Pastor Vance came out, and um, it, it was supposed to be a cold night, and he came out and was mentioning that the there's no place for our community to go as far as being warm that night, and. We came to a conclusion that we could maybe go and see people in the uh, sanctuary. He made a couple of phone calls and boom, bam, boom, <laughs> we're there. Yeah. And it's been, I ain't going to say, a, a uh, not a rocky road since then, but we managed since then to, to today. So Willie described the opening of our white flag operations. Mm -hmm. A few years earlier than that, Willie also was instrumental in the decision process for us to open our church doors and never close them. Um, we had a hurricane that was threatening to affect the coast of North Carolina. And Vance felt deep in his soul, we need to do something. What is it we can do? So Vance, Vance put a call out to several members of the leadership, I happen to be one of them, with, with that question. Well, what should we do? How can we prepare? What can, what can we help? You know, what, what's going on? Uh, and I, and I understand a few others, the simple answer was, we open our doors. We have a kitchen that has some food in it. As long as our power's on, they got power to charge things. We have a shower and we have bathrooms and we have space as long as the roof stays on our building, we have a warm, dry, safe space. So that's what we do is we open our doors. Um, Vance did take that to the board. Willie was on the board at that time and got that phone call and the board unanimously supported that concept as well. So over those first three, four days, we opened our doors. We had several people who sought shelter, some from the coastal area fleeing the hurricane but more so, we had people in our own neighborhood, living across the street, in the woods and so on, living in campgrounds, that when they realized we were open and we were willing to help anyone, they found a place that they could call home. So when the 
kind of excitement died down. Uh, you know, people can go back to the coast and that. We looked at the folks that we were serving and said, we can't go and say, no, we aren't going to do this anymore. No, nope, you can't have a shower anymore. No, nope, we don't have food. So the board and Vance and the rest of the leadership said, we have to keep this going. We have to do something. So from there, we started um, keeping our doors open, come on in, use our facilities as, as we have and what we need, and realize that food's a very important part of it. So we started working and building a food pantry with donated food from our church membership. That grew into being able to coordinate with um, the food bank and other organizations to donate food, ended up partnering with an organization um, that created a pantry that just continued to grow. At one time, the pantry actually filled our entire fellowship hall that we had to go and take our sanctuary space, and that had to be just multi-purpose space because the rest of the building was filled with things to care for other people. And I'll let Willie and Vance go from there in the story. <laughs> One of the things that, that um, was interesting and just amazing about that and, and looking at that is now reflecting on how that pantry grew. It started out in a small metal cabinet and then turned into converting a closet and converted an office. Uh, and then ultimately, as Mike said, it became the whole fellowship hall and parts of the area outside the kitchen and serving area. Um, and it, it took a lot of volunteer effort to make all of that happen. Um, Mike was one of the folks there uh, in the early days making sure there was a hot meal. It wasn't peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. It wasn't just whatever. He put thought and effort into creating a nutritious and healthy meal, but also very tasty uh, and taking into consideration all of the um, needs of the community and making sure there were as many options as possible but also making sure that there were uh, meat, non-meat, pork, non-pork options for folks based on dietary restrictions or, or even faith traditions. Um, and that, I, I share that part of it because that really highlighted the, the importance of choice and meeting people where they were at and understanding the people. Uh, that, that really kind of dominated the entire uh, operation, making sure that we weren't just providing an open door that we were actually meeting you and getting to know you and making sure that there were spaces uh, and things available for you that you had to, the ability to choose. Um, so that was really important. And, and I think for me, um, when we opened those first days, um, we, that, that same storm system came in here and actually you know, put a lot of rain here and, and we lost power in some areas, uh, but it highlighted the need uh, to, to where we're at now and what we're doing um, for how those storm systems impact people who are living in unsheltered spaces or living in non-traditional, what we would consider traditional housing, they're living in tents or other spaces out uh, in the woods, uh, and how a, a rainstorm with, with some wind impacts people in different ways and the needs it creates within the community. Uh, so I, that was a, an opening, uh, eye-opening moment for me to realize some of the work that needed to be done and some of the work that we're now able to partner with agencies and, and governments to be able to provide uh, for people. We started out around 50 people or so. Um, at its peak, um, after we had partnered with another organization, we were doing two hot meals a day for well over 100 people, often 150 people. Well, actually, as far as money, I think we really had a blind eye on that because we, <laughs> we uh, it was pretty much something that, well, maybe not the board having a blind eye, but I did because it's something that I felt that needed to be done and cost wasn't a factor. <laughs> um, it, the way I looked at it now, um, was a factor but I didn't see it. Um, but we, I mean, we handled the situation as it came along and it was like a passion of mine that we we do this 
because there were people out there that needed it. And we, we saw the fact that we could do it, so we done it. I would think at, at the core is something that Vance and, and I have always talked about, and I'm sure Vance has discussed with other people. We may not have the best there is to offer, but we always offer the best we have. Our, our community has always been about being part of the greater community around us and meeting people with where they're at. So, so way before any of this, um, one of our long-term members and, and someone who's going through seminary and working to become a pastor, Fred Kennedy, Kennedy Kelderman now, um, had this thing, we need to go and serve sandwiches to the people downtown Raleigh who need something to eat. We started a peanut butter and jelly sandwich ministry, um, which was called, and shoot my mind, uh, Lunch Boxes of Love called Lunch Boxes of Love. Um, from there, we started doing once a year services in downtown Raleigh, so we could bring the church to the people that we were meeting, because a lot of them didn't have transportation to get to us. So it wasn't strange for us to move into, all of a sudden, open our doors and have people that society has shunned in and among us and, and greeting us because we, we did have kind of early baby steps of getting used to and understanding that the problems other people have are very, very similar, if not the same, to the problems we do. And together, as, as Vance also often says, we may not be able to turn on your lights if your lights are out, but we can sit in the dark with you. The board took a stance early on in this that it was the right thing to do. Nobody questioned that part. Um, looking at how to fund it and how to, to get some of the resources, um, yeah, we had to have those questions, but it was never a question of can we do this, it was how can we make it happen. And so that was really the stance the board took from, from day one and has continued to do that. Um, and you know, there were days we didn't have a clue how we were going to make it you know, with the meals. Um, Mike, I no, no doubtedly put uh, countless dollars of his own money into that, but certainly blood, sweat, and tears, as, as did so many other volunteers. Uh, Willie retired uh, and then came to, uh, to work volunteer at the, the church full time to help manage the shelter. Uh, but there were days where you know, Mike has a history in, in culinary preparation and, and serving in a hospitality setting in large groups of people. So there were pans that he had prepared that should really serve 30, 40, maybe 50 people, uh, but those pans would serve 100 people and still have food left over. Um, so I continuously say, and we would call for seconds out of a pan that we thought wasn't going to get through everybody, we didn't have enough, enough for seconds. So it really was this two fish and five loaves ministry, um, and that happened over and over and over again. It, it happened countless times, um, and, and there's that's nothing short of a miracle. That That's not a poor planning or, or we didn't know what we were doing. This was somebody who actually knows how to do that sort of thing um, and we were still able to make it work. And people got to choose the food and got nice portions. If we didn't skimp and give you you know, a, a third of the portion you should have gotten, that you were getting a full plate. Um, and again, we were serving meals that, that we would sit down and eat ourselves with people. And so it, you know, it was really you know, good food. Um, but to Mike's point, what we said earlier, we gave you the best of what we had. We might not be able to serve you steak and lobster every night, but we were serving the best of what we have to, to serve, and it was really an amazing opportunity to be able to have that time of fellowship with people. One of the things, especially when we go back to finances and, and where did the stuff come from, because donations came in a bunch of different ways, mm -hmm. um, especially in the early years since we had just started out and we were a church, a lot of things like grants and that, oh, you need to have a history of, et cetera. So we were very much hand-to-mouth operation, not knowing tomorrow. But I attribute it to, and I think everyone else here does, because we were working and doing what God called us to do. We had a godly purpose. The purpose was to care for other people. God always provided. 
could be different each day. And, and, you know, it is going to be in God's time. It'll be timely enough. We will have it when we absolutely have to have it. But there was no assurance. And, and we ended up, I think, even our board started getting comfortable in that concept because that's one of the hardest things as someone of faith to do is to have faith over your finances that tomorrow is going to work out financially. Very, very hard. But, but we as a community and we as our leadership, bigger point is our entire church membership was behind this. Our denomination is, is unique in that the church members run the churches and actually run the denomination. So we're obligated to have membership meetings and the membership has vote and say in everything. And things are brought up and discussed and voted on. And when it came to talk about the work we were doing, what it cost, how we were going to pay for it, do we want to go and expand this program, there was like no discussion. Someone would say, this is what we want to do. And the church membership would all say, yes, but we vote, I, we need to do this. So, so there was very much a movement of the spirit in everyone in, in our community. And you even saw that within the people we were working with. Uh, um, we, we like to refer to them as guests, but I just did kind of the biggest sin. I called them them, which implies other. They are us. So they are us. They are our community and our people. And when it comes to going and taking care of people, take care of your people. The, the thing that I did, um, I don't feel I did anything to prepare people for this. I think that work had already been done and was already being done through God, certainly, uh, and Holy Spirit, uh, but through the community and the church and the work that it had, had done up, you know, at that point, almost 40 years um, of work that had been done to prepare people for this moment. And just as, as Mike said, things like what Fred was doing with the lunch boxes of love, we've taken steps along our journey that got us ready for the next steps we were going to take. So I think the church was primed and ready for such a thing, such a, a movement. The piece that I think I gave to that was the willingness to say yes and to step out on, on faith and giving people the permission to do without having to necessarily come and ask every little detail. Giving, empowering the people to be a true people's movement and to, to allow God to work in and through them uh, in collaboration with each other, but not necessarily needing my permission to go and cook a meal. I don't think Mike asked me if he could go and prepare a meal. I think he just knew there needed to be food and went and, and made food. Um, so I think that the part that I provided was the willingness to step out and say yes, and to, to, to that notion of we're, we're not going to let you sit in the dark by yourself. Uh, we'll sit with you. I'm going to step out with you in this, and, and I was there at the center day in and day out every day that we did that um, for the first however long. I mean, I don't remember now when the first time I actually took a day off after that got started. Uh, I did at some point because self-care is important, and we encourage people to do that. But um, So, yeah, the, the piece that I provided, I think, was the willingness to say yes, the, the leadership capacity to say we're going to do this and we're going to do it together. Um, and then just being there to, to walk the journey with each other uh, and to learn and grow together and being honest and saying, I don't have all the answers, but we'll step out and figure out how to do it. Uh, as long as we're stepping into this yes and, and into what God's called us to do, um, the, the answers will be provided and we'll figure it out. So that's what I feel like I've done. Willie and, and, and Mike may have other opinions on that, but that's the part that I feel like I fulfilled uh, in, in the visioning for that. For me, one of the things that Pastor did that really helped kind of stir even more up in me, um, I've always been passionate uh, on these issues, um, <laughs> but what stirred it up is Vance being willing and vulnerable and transparent enough to share his personal stories and experiences, ones prior to us ever getting involved in this, and the impacts those stories had had on his life. And then as things continue, to continue to share the stories. And sometimes they might be a tough story to hear, but there was always a lesson and there was always a godly outcome at the end of them. And that, I think, 
becomes inspiring for anyone because if they see someone else can do it, then they can. Um, Vance is also extremely humble. He, he is not, as, as he said, giving people the, the power to do and make decisions. He is not a micromanager. He isn't trying to be the top whatever in our church, let alone our denomination. I, I believe if you ask him, he would give up his vice, uh, his moderator position on the board in a second. <laughs> just be a preacher. Just be a happy little preacher. Not do any of the management. Um, because that's not his personality. So when that is kind of the person modeling on a daily, weekly basis of what godliness looks like, it really inspires others to, to follow suit. So, so we, we became more open, more giving, more transparent, more willing to share ourselves, which also meant we were willing to experience others. He saw a need. And he expressed that need, you know, the need that to others, and we just fell for it. <laughs> you know, so um, he um, the only thing I can think about was that November that he came in and was talking about the cold weather and and he pretty much had I want to say he had in mind what he wanted to do before he even came out the door to you know really ask or you know mention it to me um, which was good because it put us on the same page yeah. because that need was there. When we look at this from uh, uh, the stories that we've heard of that, we certainly have heard countless stories. Um, and, you know, people that come and tell us that, uh, you know, I'm here today because y'all were there, because this church was here, because somebody cared enough to show up. So, and we, we've got countless stories um, like that. Part of this is also understanding the impact that it's had on the volunteers and the people who were able to be there, whether the, the volunteer was someone uh, who was experiencing homelessness themselves or they were a church member or another community member that just happened to hear about what we were doing and showed up to help. Um, but hearing their stories uh, was impactful as well and, and how them coming in and seeing this work, coming in and having the opportunity to sit down and talk with somebody, how it was spiritually fulfilling for them, it was healing for them, it, it created space for them to be able to see good in a world that is filled with a lot of uh, hate being the forward-facing uh, thing a lot of times. So, so there's a lot of stories on both sides if we look at that uh, from folks who are coming to volunteer versus, uh, or as a, in addition to folks who are coming to receive services. And ultimately I would say we all show up to receive. We, we ultimately all are getting something out of this. Um, that may not be the reason we showed up, but it is absolutely, I, I feel a lot of times early in, in the early days, the best way I can describe it is I felt selfish to some degree because I felt like when I would sit and meet with somebody or talk with somebody that I got as much if not more out of the conversation than they did. Um, and a lot of times it was me coming to understand, you know, maybe my own shortcomings, my own misgivings or, or things that I needed to learn uh, experiences that I needed to have, um, or just a new respect for people and, and the God that I can see in people when I sit and talk with, with various folks. So there's a lot of those stories out there. Uh, Fenton shares some of the uh, most amazing parts of that because he gets another one of our volunteers who's there every single day who truly yearns for this and misses it when he's not here. And it's, it's a part of who he is, and it's been very healing for him. Um, and, and I just had one of our um, friends that have been a part of this journey with us for many years um, who has been experiencing homelessness recently um, and has had that uh, experience over her life um, 
she's a, a trans woman who uh, openly talked to me about this, that she's had to engage in sex work numerous times and for years to be able to, to find places to live and have money to survive. Uh, and she shared with me a, a few weeks ago in tears that because of what we're doing, because of the shelter that's there every day, that she's not had to do that. It's not that she's not been forced into that space uh, to be able to survive because she's at least known where she was going to be able to go sleep tonight. Uh, and she said there are several people that are in that same position that she knows of that are so grateful for the work that is being done to be able to provide that space so that they can have an opportunity. And, and again, there's countless stories like that. Um, so it, it, it's important for us to stop and remind ourselves of the importance of what it is that we're doing, why we're doing what we're doing. Um, but it's also important for us as, as the volunteers, the staff, the people who are making it happen to, to understand the, the value and what we're doing and to share our own experiences and stories with how it impacts us. Because that, you know, when she shared that with me, I, there's many days that I, I question what in the hell am I doing? <laughs> why, why are we doing this? And then there's one of those stories that pops up uh, and it's like, thank you God, I appreciate that. I won't ask again for a little while, so anyway. Mm -hmm. Talking about gratitude um, from the, the people in our community and the people that we work with, it's really, really unique because we certainly don't do anything that we do with the intent of getting any type of reward, thank you, anything. That, that would be the wrong reason to be doing it. And the Bible has several stories to, to explain why that's wrong um, and worth a study. But we just do it. And we know we've done well in what we're doing when the people that we're working with and the people that we're ultimately we're living with, because some of us are spending 8, 10, 12 hours a day, we're, we're living with these people, want to help continue it. When they see you doing something and they want to join in and help, or they see you walking by, it's, can I? How can I? What can I do? just had a recent experience in talking with some of our folks as they were waiting to go in. Um, in the evenings, uh, the guys tend to line up. Um, they get off work um, because many of the people that we work with actually have jobs. The jobs just don't pay them enough to actually be able to afford housing. And they've really, really enjoyed, well, it's been white flag season. So, you know, cold nights, we've been there open and we were able to work and make it so it's seven days a week. Um, this year, first time we've been able to do that. So even when it wasn't super cold, they still had a place and they had some place stable and consistent. Well, they know that white flag ends at the end of March. So they already started in February asking, what are we going to do? Where can we go? How? What, what's happening? What, what can we do so that this can continue? Um, and then holding those conversations, um, spoke with them, and, and we believe in being transparent and honest. So I talk up, talk to them about, well, our funding's right now, our primary funding's coming from a couple government entities. We've already been in discussion with them. We've actually prepared budgets and proposals and presented it. We're waiting to hear back from them. As soon as we know something, we're, we're going to share with you, but we are mentally functioning that this is going to continue, and we're doing everything to make it continue. But it really, it's about getting the funding because, you know, even at the per person cost being very, very low, we're serving two to 300 people a day. That all of a sudden becomes a significant fund amount. And facilities are one of the biggest. So we're, we're in some nice facilities right now, um, but they're slated to be renovated uh, and actually torn down and turned into um, condos, et cetera. So we need to find another building. So when talking with them, it's like, well, when this gets tore down, where are we going to go? Is there another space? It's like, we, we've been looking into all that, too. We've actually identified a place that, that we think would work really good, and we've set up meetings so that our government funders can come look at it. We're, we're, it's going to be a couple weeks, but they're going to come look at it. They're like, well, well, you know, what do you need? It's like, it's getting the money. You know, as, as a church, we don't have the money just to buy that piece of property. Well, what is it? 
what's it going to cost? Well, it happens the, the property we're looking at, and Raleigh's an expensive community, and this is it's a former private school building. It's going to be about six million dollars. And I said that number, and the people literally their jaw dropped. You, you could see them kind of go pale with that's an insurmountable obstacle. And, and to be honest, you know, I, I'm fortunate I have my own place to live, but I, I'm about three steps away from being a guest in the shelter as well. So I can understand where they were coming from. And, and one of them spoke up and said, well, I thought you were going to say a couple hundred thousand. I was like, no. But remember, we're talking about some government entities. That number is not impossible when we go and get the local government and federal government and some grants and, and some other places together. That money is a very doable number. Don't be afraid. And then one of the gentlemen um, who, among all of the things that they're having to deal with in life, um, it includes some mental health issues. And they reached in their back pocket and pulled out this little pack of paper. And they, they clearly knew what was on each one. They were all folded. And they kind of shuffled through and pulled one out and handed it to me and said, give this to the person who, who takes your ties. And I, I politely accepted it and, and um, went on without opening it, which is, for me, anytime someone gives a guess or says it's a tie, you know, you certainly don't sit there and look at it. But when I got home, I opened it. One of the things this person had done is they had created on a piece of paper whether it's a check or a bill, not sure what, it was an $800,000 gift he was giving to us. For him and from him, he gave me $800,000. He actually believes he, he did that. And I am so happy to have received it. The fact that a person who is struggling with having anything is willing to give away that much value in something that important that he knew exactly where it was and how much was on that one and so on, that's the gratitude. The, the fact that I know any single day if something did happen in my situation and I didn't stay there, I would go into a place that I had friends. That, you know, Willie can attest, to, we have people now that it's been at least six years, seven years since we started all of this. We have friends who come and visit us every week, if not every day, for those seven years. They may have never stepped in our sanctuary or come to a church service because that's not them, but because we meet them with where they're at, and they meet us where we're at, because, as Van said earlier, we've made some mistakes along the way. We, we've done things that, you know, could be better, and, and we're learning from them. They've lived with us and been friends with us through it all. And that is gratitude. When someone can be called your friend and you can call them friend, that's the gratitude you get out of this work. Let's start with the day center. Our day center was, this, was looked at to be a place, a safe place for them to come in and rest for a while. One o'clock till four or five. Um, come in, get coffee. Um, we have little snacks there that, you know, they can munch on and just sit around and conversate with each other. We, um, try to involve ourselves, you know, the the staff in in those conversations just so we can hear, you know, really what what's going on. I I like to hear what's going on, you know, when they leave there. Um, that's okay. just kind of uh, no Willie, help me out because I know in the daytime activities We've included things um, such as mail services. 
um, and some things with computers and some things of getting people connected to resources. And I know you deal with it day to day. So, so what are some of those things that are outside of just giving you a space that we've grown into being able to offer? Well, we um, also have our mail services, which uh, on a daily basis we pick up mail, you know, from a post office box and take it to the shelter. Um, wouldn't be possible for the guests to get. Um, so we offer a mail service, which um, we collect the mail and have it in folders, you know, for guests to pick up. We also have uh, coordinated entry, which is um, helping with rent and this and that, and also to find that that safe spot for the uh, guests that won't that don't mind living in the shelter, but don't want to be in the shelter. I mean, it's a good place to be if you have nothing else. But if you can have something of your own, that's even better. Um, and we also have it if a person needs to make resumes or uh, fill out job applications. We do have a computer there that you can uh, log on and do what you need to do on the computer. Now, are, are you a computer expert? Or are there people that you tap into as, as people are trying to maneuver their way around applications and all that? No, I am not a computer <laughs> expert. And I will help as much as I can when I can't. I am hoping that the person that I call can help me get through it, which I have made several phone calls to friends that are computer, computer delivered that they can walk me through it. and. I, I was trying to bet you because I know many of the, the people in our community actually have very extensive well, computer I, skills, sometimes say that. using them inappropriately, but they have those skills and abilities, and it, it, it is also a take care of one another type concept that, that exists in our community and has since day one. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the folks who are living without walls have made little encampments. They found groups of friends and they live as a community. And if one has, they all share. So that is something that is just imbued through our community all the way through, um, not coming from us, but coming to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They have taught me a lot of things. <laughs> a lot of this goes back to when St. John's was, was basically outgrowing our location on Glenwood Avenue. In that, I was part of the um, trustees at the time and part of looking at, well, where is the church going to move to? What's the next iteration of the church going to look like? At which point, I was given a vision of a city on a hill. Now, I have, in addition to my color, culinary background, another one of the careers I had was in some real estate work um, and, and some commercial construction work and so on. So very familiar with triple P, PPP type projects, um, also REITs. Um, and the, the vision came, well, we need to not just have a church. What we need to do is get together with some partners and do some housing and have a facility that has some medical services in it and that that community and that development should have some restaurants and other businesses so people can have jobs at and a place to go out and eat and 
entertainment themselves. And within all of that, well, there would be a church on the property. And that would be one of the ways that our community, as a small community, could actually fund having more and a nicer church, a nicer facility, is because all these other things feed upon themselves and create revenue from outside. And revenue generating without making someone come into the door, sit in a pew, and offer up 10% of their income. Uh, so, so that's the vision that I was given. And as I was sharing it with the pastor at that time, and that pastor's spouse, she, she screamed hallelujah. The, the Holy Spirit hit the pastor's spouse in a way it's like, absolutely, I've been seeing something like that in my dreams and, and didn't know where to talk about it. So we sat down, and a few other people had that as well. We actually wrote out kind of a plan for, for the city on the hill. Um, and that still permeates everything we do today. Now, what we're doing right now looks very different than the vision I was given. And where we will go to will not look like what we're doing now and will not look like that original vision. But the concept of being in community, so the church, government organizations, private sector, working together to create a community that cares for one another and that caring for one another helps feed and give opportunity to everyone. That ultimately is at the core of everything we do. Um, and, and I believe is at the core of the Church Universal and where the Church Universal has always wanted to go and has tried to go. And, and like all church groups, we, we venture in some wrong directions from time to time. But the beauty is working with um, working within our faith, we can always right the road and get back on path and know that sometimes we got to snake around a little bit to get where we're going. Sometimes we have to walk around the mountain because we didn't know how to say mountain move. But in walking around the mountain, we might have learned how to say mountain move to the next mountain. There are several ways that somebody can support what we're doing uh, if, if they want to get involved here locally. One, you can come and volunteer at the shelter. That, that first and foremost, I think, is one of the most important components. Um, but volunteering, and there's volunteer opportunities for folks who want to work during the shelter's open hours and during the hours that it's not open and getting prepared for its next operational period. Um, you can look at our needs list and provide resources, uh, items, things that we need to, to survive and to run every single day. Um, and you can also give financially. There's ways to, to give uh, financially and help uh, make sure that we're able to continue doing the work we're doing. We do have outside support from the, the city and the county, uh, but it takes more than what we're able to, to get from those agencies. Uh, and realistically, it, it really should be a community effort. So we need financial giving, we need people to come and support, uh, we need uh, supplies to be able to, to function. The other thing that we need uh, are volunteers who are willing to come and sit with people and help them tell their stories, just as, as, as Mike and Willie have talked about with some of the folks telling us how they've been impacted by the work that's being done at the shelter uh, and asking what do they do to help make sure that it continues. Um, we need, I can go and stand, Willie and, and Mike can go and stand before City Council and County Commission all day long and tell them about the great work we're doing. And that's important, but it's really important when someone who has lived experience who is using the services is there talking about and telling their own story. Me not sharing their story for them, but them telling it in their own words. So somebody to help for, for the people who are willing to do that and want to do that, to be able to help prepare them to do that and how to go and, and talk in a meaningful way to be heard. So people helping lift the voice of the folks whose voices have been taken from them. Uh, so that's just some of the ways that you can get involved. You can certainly go to our website uh, uh, the shelter's website specifically is wakewhiteflag.org, uh, or you can go to the church's website, uh, and I'm sure you'll put all that in the lower thirds of the videos, but um, to, to be able to find out ways to give. If, if I can add to that, another important way that everyone can live, give, at least everyone in our community, but nationally as well, it's through voting and voting with intention. So selecting and voting for people to hold office who are going to help fund programs like this, help set up systems that will work and tear down systems that aren't working.
and that across the board in all the communities, but you know, even here for us, decisions made on the federal level affect whether our shelter can operate. A, a lot of the funding for White Flag and, and currently for Drop-In is funding that is passing through the county and city, but from a federal funding program. So if that funding on the federal level goes away, the city and county don't have the money. Well, you notice I didn't mention the state. Well, maybe we should work on electing some people so that the state's helping fund this as well and more involved. Um, we, we had an opportunity to work with some um, bureaucracy people with the state and started working with them on how the state could be involved. But their life has shifted and they've moved away and they're no longer connected. And we never made that permanent connection. So we'd look for help from the state. You know, it, 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 that vote you have is so important you need to make sure it counts and you're selecting people who are going to care about and put feet to the road for the things you care about. How folks get involved in their various communities uh, can be very uh, unique to the community itself. Uh, the first point would be finding out what the needs are within your community finding out who's already doing work in the community and getting connected with those folks so that we're not working in silos. Um, and then seeing where the needs and your passions align uh, and then starting to move forward in that direction. And it could be something as simple as saying, you know what, one day a year we're going to get together and make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and take down to a park and just share them with anybody who wants to eat. That's what we did. That was one of the ways that we got involved. Um, but, but it can be as simple as that. It doesn't have to be this grand thing. You don't have to open up a, a multi-million dollar shelter. You don't have to go and start serving three hot meals a day. It's really about finding out the needs are in your community, how you can get involved, and understanding the concept that we're not doing this by ourselves. We are a small church. We are helping lead the effort, but we're not doing this by ourselves. We have engaged the community. We've engaged other partner organizations to come together and help do this work. So find the need. Figure out what it is where your passions align with that need. Fill it and don't do it by yourself. But but don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, and if we're able to help uh, and talk about how we've done what we've done, we'll be glad to do that. Uh, I wish I had an agency sort of like ours uh, when we were starting all this to have called and said, okay, give me the ins and outs of this thing. We didn't have that. <laughs> we jumped in and said, okay, we're going to figure it out. So that's where I would start. And again, that can be very unique to the individual community. Maybe it is working with folks experiencing homelessness. Maybe it's working with LGBTQ folks. Maybe it's working with women who have had their rights taken away. Maybe it's working with immigrant populations or other folks that are being disenfranchised. Um, but no matter where you're at, what community you're in, you're, there, there are needs in your community, whether you see them or not. Vance said, don't do it alone. And that is absolutely 100% true. Uh, number one, please do it with whatever your faith tradition calls God. Um, that, that's number one. But more importantly, do it as part of community. Um, uh, I believe right now we have six, seven other churches that one way or the other contribute and help out, whether they're um, collecting food items and bringing them over once a week that, that we have some snack items to distribute, to going and taking their youth center and making that available so we have expanded white flag opportunities, to sending volunteers over to do some cleaning for us. It, it, it's not about being a savior. It's about being community. We have a saying, a saying here, not sure where it came from, but Vance was pastor at the time, so we'll blame Vance, Vance for it. It's not about religion. It's about relationship. That's what you're doing. You're going into an activity to actively build relationships. Build relationships with people who you know are struggling. Build, re build relationships with similar organizations to yours, whether it's a faith community or another group that is helping serve and meet a need. And don't ever make it a competition. As you go in and you see and you learn about what your community needs and 
where your passions are and how to fit in, look for the gaps. Drop in center or drop in shelter is a gap in our community. We have several shelters that have wonderful shelter um, opportunities. They are all program based, working on taking the person from that point of being unhoused into housing one way or another. So there's no room for the person who is just unhoused. Uh, there's no early entry point. They have to get into a program. They have to sit, fill out applications, have to wait up to six months before they can get into that shelter. Well, what are they doing for the six months? So that's the gap we're filling there. When we first started with White Flag, um, we didn't mention. It was COVID. That was where the huge need came that, that November um, 2020 day was the shelters here normally would open for white flag and they would have space that anyone could come in. But because of COVID, they couldn't open their doors. So there was literally no place for people to go. And that's what screamed to Devance and what laid on Lily's heart is, you know, the services that were there are no longer there. Someone needs to provide them. And, and you know, as we talked about many things, it's, again, We've got a sanctuary. That's a big room with a bunch of, we have nice soft chairs for our pews, but a big room, big space. That's not being used tonight because our services are during the day. Well, we got heat, we got a room. Let's put people in it so they don't freeze to death tonight. If you want to know more about how we've done what we've done, uh, you can go to the dedicated webpage on our website that tells you all about how uh, you can contact us and schedule a time to meet and talk or schedule one of us to come out and share with your community.